When life throws you a curveball, how are you going to handle adversity? Welcome to the Fearless Mindset Podcast, where you're about to go on a journey as I interview security, business, and entertainment leaders on what it takes to stay fearless. I'm your host, Mark Ludlow, and enjoy today's episode. Welcome, everybody, to the show. We got Paul Turner. He flew out from Washington, D.C., to the studio here in Irvine, California, to join us. And uh, Paul, you have some stories to share. And uh, thanks for coming out, man. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. It was, uh, it was good to get out here and see uh, how bad LA's doing right now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> how's that train ride in Amtrak? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, dude, people are not joking. I get why people are leaving now. That is right. I, I, man, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I thought DC was bad with, with the homeless people. But mm-hmm. Jesus. <laughs> you flew all the way out and. Last time we talked, we were on live streaming on Facebook, mm-hmm. and you shared with us January 6th and what happened there. And we'll okay. go into more in detail about that a little bit later. But uh, you have had a crazy, what, month, couple months, couple crazy couple of six months in D.C. with everything going on? Yeah, probably a year. A year, okay. Say, probably a year, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, glad to have you out and have a chat and <laughs> talk Paul's life and journey and Army veteran being blown up by shells and Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, running a security company. So yeah, hmm. looking forward to hearing all about it. Uh, yeah, where should I start? Hey, let's go into Army, Army days. Well, I was uh, I was born in New Jersey, New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, you know, I, I I knew I was going to join the Army from like right. the time I was a sophomore because my grades are so terrible. I think I think I uh, think I graduate with an average of like sixty seven. <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> my dad, my dad told me it was like, he's like, don't you know the reason they pass you is because you're joining the army already, and they, you know, right? And I was like, yeah, they they want to see me go off to some war. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now I went and went in the army, and um, right, it was actually probably the first time in my life I really ever excelled at anything, like really did well. I mean, I I took to the army incredibly well. Um, went to second infantry division, fifth brigade, uh, 23rd infantry regiment and, uh, Fort Lewis. And, um, you know, wanted to be a sniper and became a sniper, you know, uh, sniper in the army. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Class four. What's your uh, longest shot? Oh, um, I mean with the, uh, with the M24, it's, it's, it's always 1200 meters. Um, how many confirmed kills can you tell? Or is it classified? Oh, actually I have none. Oh, dang it. Yeah, I actually have a. Weird... You didn't kill any deer or anything for food or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually have a weird, weird uh, story about that. Though. Oh, dude. Uh, yeah, when I was um, when I was deployed, there was a um, we were out on election day for in Afghanistan, and uh, mm-hmm. we were uh, you know, we were out all night, and you know, under my starlight scope, you know, with my striker unit, I um, mm-hmm. I could tell like I see all these lights move around the um mountaintops and i called you know called him to my platoon so i was like hey you know are we expecting a and a out here uh you know afghan afghani army and uh mm-hmm. they're like no we have we have no afghani army out here today i'm like oh shit we're being surrounded on three sides beep, beep, i mean beep. yeah vehicles you know coming up and down you see mm-hmm. the lights and the flashlights you know through through our nods and, and through the scope and everything and um lone survivor all over again well i was like yeah well i ended up falling asleep over not like on my rifle like through the night because it was just mm-hmm. yeah and anyone who's been in the middle, especially the infantry, anyone's been in knows eventually the whole thing just becomes a shit show and people start falling asleep on top of themselves. And it was kind of like the situation that happened where we were just out there, you mm-hmm. know, waiting for something to happen so long that, you know, woke up. And um, I remember being like, even though it's, it's summertime in Afghanistan, like you're so used to the heat that you're really cold. And like I had this like um, canned cloth that we're going to use, you know, something to kind of blend in with in the desert. And I'm like, like wrapped up like this and I'm eating like breakfast. And, uh, you know, we're waiting for the election to start at 9 a.m. And it's like, you know, 8.50, 8.55. And 9 a.m. is like, <laughs> just freaking mortar start coming down. We're like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. We just jump in <laughs> our vehicles. And we're, you know, like, like we don't even know where we're maneuvering to. We're just starting to maneuver. And, mm-hmm. yeah, I remember um, we could we saw the mortar team and we're trying to maneuver on them to, to take them out. And uh, mm-hmm. But these wobbies, these, these, like, ditches that are in there, they – um they we can't get past them i mean these things are six feet deep and they're i don't know five or six feet wide i guess and you know maybe long maybe further i mean this is 
years and years ago. My memory is kind of fading on it. But, uh, you know, we, we can't maneuver on them. But, you know, in a distance, I saw this guy, you know, his binoculars and a radio, and he's he's being a four observer. He's calling in, you know, fire with his mortar team. And, you know, I dialed him right into my rifle and I called in. I was like, you know, I got a, got a target ready, you know, I take a shot, you know, said it really candidly to my police officer. And he's like, can you, can you find a, a weapon on him? I was like, no. He's like, well, you, you know, are we? And I'm like, uh, you know, but he's, he's obviously, uh, okay, fine. And I never, never forgot that guy. I never, for, never let that go. I never forgot him. There, you know, I mean, there's, there's people who've like, who have, you know, taken out a lot of people. A lot of, there's people who have, have a lot of, um, you know, have killed a lot of people in, in, in these wars past. And it was kind of a, uh, it's a cop out to be like, yeah, you know, and also very honest to be like, no, I, I never have, but there's something that does fundamentally change about you. The moment you decide you're going to kill someone. What's that like psychologically? It's freeing. Freeing? It's freeing at, at first. It's freeing because like war and combat, it's, it's a very surreal situation. And it's, it's surreal because it's probably more or less how life should be. And, and, and the way that, you know, how we've, we've, um, you know, we've evolved, you know, it's, it's about survival. It's about your, your base instincts, your base needs, you know, eating, surviving, being part of the platoon, um, being, you know, being part of the, this cohesive unit, you know, you forget about money, you forget about a lot of family, you forget about society, these, these things that, that they don't really matter. And that next step is, is, is to like, is, is to, to take someone's life. And, and, and I don't, I, I, I could never imagine in, you know, what, if I, if I did shoot him, like, um, you know, what step further it was, but I, I, I do remember that that was like, that was a very like changing moment because it's real. Like it was a real thing and, and, and nothing, not too many other things are that real. It, nothing's truly that genuine as, as like making the decision to kill someone else. And, um, and I didn't. And, you know, that's something I'm often ashamed of. You know, even in that movie uh, Jarheads, which is a re actually a rather, you know, accurate take on mm -hmm. the military and, and warfare and and, and probably sn and, and snipers, honestly. Um, you know, like that, you know, he's like, you're not really a sniper until you, you know, seen the, the, the red mist or whatever, you know. I think there there's some, some people feel that way. And sometimes I do too. And it took me a, it took me a long time years of my life to to work that back and, and, and remember that you know I followed the orders to a T I did what I was told and I followed the rules you know I did the and you know what if I just shot him like wh what would that have done for my life now I just illegally killed someone and frankly my unit you know um, not my company but my my brigade was actually caught up in that we, we were part of um, they, they were the kill team that they talk about where the they had a bunch of uh, people who just killed civilians and they um there's their code name kill team uh they, they they made a documentary about it really I didn't uh, know that. yeah it's called kill team and um you're in a movie how about that yeah not not my company not my company. not even my battalion but another battalion another battalion but, but some of the guys that i um you know was with they they knew them um okay. you know, they're friends with them and stuff like that and like a lot of these people you know went to jail for a long time you know they were doing kinds of crazy things i think I, I mean i never really got in, too into it but i, I remember people saying that they were like saving people's ears and shit like that and wearing them and like, you know, all the whatever platitudes that people, young infantrymen say, some were actually like doing it, like keeping body parts and trying to wear them as jewelry and things like that. Um, very odd. Yeah. So there's a, um, but yeah, there's, there's a documentary called, um, would that be a result of like PTSD or something snapping or something? Oh fuck. I don't know. <laughs> I never mm, kept anyone's that's, fingers. That's gross. Yeah. It's gross. It's uh, it's it's weird. Well, you know, the problem is that our chain of command fell apart right from the beginning. Interesting. So, like my, when my unit a couple days from deploying, we had like this um, um, we had a steroid scandal, and like my first sergeant was relieved of duty. Wow. And a lot of other people were relieved as well because it's and, and it was upper leadership, and mm -hmm. you know, not to say that you, if you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, you should get in trouble, but mm -hmm. we're, we're leaving your command of duty prior to. You know, a, a, a week away from deploying with your unit, it's, it's probably red, not the best move. Red flag going up, you know? Yeah. Um, What's up with that move? <laughs> well, I think it's big army and, and big rules, you know? Mm. 
You know, that, I think that's what it is. I think that's the the bureaucracy of of, of the big, of the large army. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, no, I don't think a special unit. You know, a ranger battalion probably would never done that. They probably would have took care of it in house. Dang you! You were living in a real life movie over there yeah. in a war. It it was a lot of like <laughs> it was a lot of sitting around. Like it, mm-hmm. it really was until I got you know until I got blown up and then. Now let's talk about that. I mean. What day, what time, what was going on that day, that morning, that evening? So, yeah. Um, so I'd pretty much, you know, I pretty much just gone <laughs> totally native to be honest. <laughs> native? What's that mean? <laughs> like I totally was just like, whatever, man, we're just doing, we're just doing this war thing now. Go through know? the motions. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was just like, you know, starting mm-hmm. to, you were getting into like the, the growing beard thing. Stop taking shower. I haven't showered in like two weeks. Bonafide we're hippie. Running out of food. <laughs> Going hippie style, huh? Yeah, I mean, it was just like you, you were out there. We're like uh-huh. we were out in, you know, out in this, it, out, just we're out in this town. Like we mm-hmm. weren't, we weren't by a, a, a base. We had a cob. Mm-hmm. So we, so like the company rented a property, and like we just lived in there in the desert, slept on the, every you know, slept on the ground every day. Right. And it was just like, you know, you just you kind of get it's weird. You kind of get used to this mm-hmm. this, this kind of crap after a while, and you're just like, yeah, okay, man. And you just kind of like you're. You're like, I'm just doing this thing. And I remember um, my lieutenant came over to my sniper team. It was like, um, he's like, listen, we got the mission that you're born to do. And I was like, All right, yeah, what, what's up? And he's like, uh, you're coming on a PSD mission. We're going to the bazaar to buy nails. <laughs> nails. Okay. <laughs> so they, you know, they need to like kind of work, build, you know, they, we had to build this thing. I mean, we mm-hmm. just, you know, this, this cob, we showed up and we had nothing but like some tents and vehicles and mm-hmm. we're sleeping on the ground and, you know, it's like we're not really doing much out there. I mean, we're taking, we're taking a couple, um, you know, we're doing co- a couple like, you know, just bullshit, you know, missions. We're just going over and we brought food to another unit once, you know, like down the road. And um, the, uh, you know, he's like, yeah, tomorrow we're gonna take your team out and do a P- PST, you know, PST mission. And uh, so we did. And I, you know, I was out there and kind of doing my thing, and you know, kind of. I mean, you're you're 22 years old, 23, 20. I was like, yeah, 23 years. You're 23 years old, and you're in Afghanistan, and you're in charge of a sniper team. Mm-hmm. It's like, <laughs> which, which, when you think about it, as you when you're 33, you're like, I can't believe anyone lets people do that. How old were you? I, I was 23. That's young. And I was, I, I had my own sniper team. Wow, yeah. that's cool. And I'm following around a lieutenant who's got a million dollars in Afghani money in his book bag. You're the boss. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> like, well, kind of. Bling, bling. <laughs> when, when it's a team of three, you kind of like. Right. <laughs> kinda, you're not you're not really control much because it's like it's two against one, literally. Right. But, you know, we're, we're walking around and, and you know, it's kind of funny because there's like giant pot plants, you know, like hmm. like 16 foot pot plants hanging out. You're like, what is that? You know, your buds coming out. looks like your arm. It's, you know, you see things like that. And honestly, it's like you, you're seeing all these Afghani people and it's, it's just giant bizarre. And, mm. and so like, I remember um, like, you know, I, I was, my, my Lieutenant went in a building, you know, went into like a little shack you know, to, to buy, I think uh, cell phone SIM cards. That's the other thing we needed that. And we also needed a lot of cigarettes and uh, he, he comes back out. And, I, and as I turn around, this guy had come into the middle of the street and he, he, I don't know if he'd blew himself up or someone had blown him up, but all suddenly, you know, I was just in an, in an explosion direct directly in the explosion. And, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, people always ask me how close and it's like uh, 20 feet, 25 feet. I mean, who, who really, who really knows right. close. I was on the edge of the street and he was in the middle of the street. That's kind <laughs> of of the other road. And, you know, like, you know, all suddenly like I took shrapnel on my neck, and I took it, um, a bunch of parts of my hands. I had a vest on, so like obviously that's fine. And and you know, I took it in my legs. And then, you know, the, it's it, getting blown up really close. Is 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 it's a weird sensation because it's like getting punched inside out. It's like someone punched you from inside your head out. And it's um, you know, it's very jarring. And then also pot- potassium nitrate smells like unique. And it's kind of those things happen once, but you know, you, you know, I was jarred and uh, you know, kind of like instinctually just started crawling into like a ball and then getting low. But like I did it, I get as I remember it very slow, and um, and um, <clears throat> you know, after a minute or two, I I, realized, I was like, well, where's my team? And 
my lieutenant, you know, his glasses off, you know, fucked up. And it's like, you know, sitting like this, the kind of stuff. And he's like crawling up to me. And, and then like, you know, my, uh, Casper is like over here and he's, he's down and he, his legs kind of jacked up. And then my shooter, Hoy, <laughs> I guess he got, he was behind some wheelbarrows. So he was fine. He actually made a joke because only one piece of shrapnel hit him and it went through the lowest part of his ear lobe right here. So like he pierced his ear. <laughs> he literally goes, dude, look. <laughs> and in the middle of all of it, he's like, dude, look. Got a new earring hole. <laughs> yeah. It was like, like in the middle of all this going on, he like found a joke in it. <laughs> and um, Some comedy and war. Yeah. I never, never forgot that. He's like, dude, look. And I was like, are so you okay? He's like, yeah, I was, be, I was behind <laughs> these wheelbarrows. And, you know, like, it is wildly the first thing I looked out is it was just these two guys, this this guy's like two legs, you know, separated from the knees. And, you know, I was just covered in his shit, like like his his body, like his organs and, and whatever else. Just, just, yeah, like it's like I don't know, like it's just kind of this mush, it's it's on you. Mm. And um Do you have flesh on your body? Oh, well, yeah, entirely your... covered, yeah, entirely covered with it. I, wow. I actually didn't realize mm. at first, but the shrapnel had hit both of my um straps on my helmet wow. and cut them so like my strip my helmet was just dangling so i eventually just had to like take it take it like just took it off because it's like <clears> the <throat> straps are all like screwed up and it was a, it was a total mass cow like everyone was wounded everyone was down my entire platoon was down everyone lived uh, except for the uh one interpreter he i think i believe he passed um but you know this um now how did you remain fearless at that moment oh i didn't you didn't. Were you scared out of your mind, or what was going on? Well, it's so surreal. Well, one, you took a major head injury, <laughs> so you're not even thinking. You're not yeah. cognitively. You're just out. Well, I didn't know. I, was, I, I felt the uh, shrapnel go into my neck, but like wow. after and it, it, it stung and burned like really bad for a second. But I kind of mm. forgot about it with a couple minutes, and like you know, the this one captain is Captain Cook. I believe his name was. Who, mm -hmm. I, I just met him just then coming on the striker. He was just he was just in the striker with me. Never met the guy before. And he's like, oh, you, you're, you're hemorrhaging out of your neck. And you're bleeding out of my neck. And I was like, oh, shit, okay. And I, I didn't want to, like, get patched up or anything. But the medic came over and put something on me real fast. And um, the, the weirdest part was was that Casper, after a couple of minutes, he was like, hey, dude, look. He's like, I was like, what? He's like, he's like dude, look in front of you. And I, I, I already said that. When he said that, I didn't look in front of me. I don't know why. But I was like, he's like, no, look, look. And I looked down. And the dude's head was sitting in front of me. It landed in front of me, like right there. Holy crap. It was, it was like sideways. I got a picture of you. You see it? Sure. Yeah. Can we show that, Christopher? No. <laughs> Never mind. Disregard. <laughs> wow. That's a Friday the 13th movie, like real time. Dude, as it is severed head right here. I got a picture. I'm not lying. It's right here. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to show it on TV. That's probably for the no, best. No, nah, we don't want to do that. It's too graphic. I guess they flipped out of sideways when I saw it. They, I think they flipped it over to to take a picture. But yeah, that's that's him. Whoa. Yeah, that's that's his. That gives me chills looking at that. Ugh. Yeah, that's just not normal. Yeah. It, so the explosion, the impact. Well, yeah, it just pops it like it just wow. Takes everything out. It's a, it's a chest rig, from my understanding, and uh, you know it was. It was, it was it was you know it was a wild it was a wild day. The weird thing is after it happens mm -hmm. and you're like oh let's 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 oh, we're gonna do it let's fuck, let's go fucking you know do our thing, and then that's it. That's that's that's, that's an RBG that came in and exploded. So who knows where it came from? No, no, it was a suicide bomber. A suicide bomber. Yeah, he blew himself up in front of us. He went. Holy. We walked into between. So like when when they're um, you know the platoons uh, the platoon obviously would be um, you know one side of the road the other like a kind of road march style. So he's right in the middle of you guys. Yeah, he just came in the middle of us because it's a bazaar. Wow. So there's like tons of people there. He killed. Wow. Uh, uh, from our understanding, from my recollection, he killed some civilians. So that was a suicide bomber's head. Yes. That popped off. He, it came up and then I guess it landed right there. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so like so. Well, he went to with his Sharia law. He went to see whatever they believe. I guess so. The, you know, the real sad thing is, is that there, you know, people were telling about because the first we were like, yeah, you know, the, mm -hmm. the guy's got, I mean, he got what he deserved. He literally blew himself up. Yeah. So, and now he's blown up. So I guess that's, that's justice. And someone was like, you know, you understand. It's a lot of times these people, they capture their families and uh, they force them to do it. Leveraging. Yeah. Which, you like know, a ransom. Right. You can't really feel one way about things like warfare when you realize that it is a very complex thing and that this person, you know, he might have, done this to save his entire family like you it? said exactly yeah they it, gave him an ultimatum you do this we'll kill your entire family and the taliban probably had him over a barrel yeah so i you know so i flew into Bagram. Mm -hmm. um 
you know, I, I got back to my my car. I was fine. I mean, my legs are kind of jacked up. I thought I broke my femur, but it turns out it was just mm -hmm. shrapnel wounds, kind mm -hmm. of make everything tighten up. And you know, mm -hmm. until you get torn up, you you don't know what it's like to be torn up, I guess. But um, how how many days were you on IRR and all that? I mean, so that's so that's the crazy part, right? So mm -hmm. this is where you can seem crazier. So I showed the Bagram. And, uh, you know, there's a special forces medics working on me and mm -hmm. he's like, no, your leg's fine. And he's, you know, patching me up. And then they send me over to CAF, uh, Cano airfield mm -hmm. and I'm in the hospital and they, um, you know, they're, you know, it's, it's everything's kind of fine. I'm actually hanging out with this guy Hunt who was mm -hmm. a private at the time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we got, you know, we went there together kind of, kind of, you know, got blown up. He was like, he, he got massively jacked up his hands. I think his hands to his day is like still messed up. So like, sure. he's got a hundred percent. He's, he's fully retired now, but, um, you know, they, you know, they give me a phone. I get to call my family and I'm talking to him. I'm talking to my dad. I'm kind of, kind of like really nonchalant. Like, yeah, apparently my leg's not broken. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to hang out here for two weeks, drink some, uh, drink some milkshakes, kind of hang out, you know, at the, at the beach. Cause it's a boardwalk, you know, calf's a big boardwalk and it's, it's, you know, mm -hmm. For, you sometimes you almost forget a war's going on. So it's like you know, theater, it's, popcorn, yeah. Licorice. It's like all these different you know Western. shops and things like that, and it's like, you know pizza and there's a Burger King there, and mm -hmm. you know the Canadians play hockey in the middle. They have a hockey rink set from it. Yeah, it's a city. It's like it's it's like mm. if you live on a fob and you probably for outside of the occasional rocket attacks, mm -hmm. uh, you, you probably forget there's ever a war going on if you weren't you know, wearing a uniform. So I'm like talking to him. I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm gonna probably hang out here for two weeks, and I'll get my, I'll get my new gear because my gear's all screwed up, and I'll be back with my unit. And as I'm doing that, four doctors come in, and they're like, hey, hang up the phone, hang up the phone real fast. I was like, I gotta go. They're like, listen, he's like, uh, we've never really seen this before, but what we think happened is the shrapnel that went into your neck went into your blood, and it went through your body and is now in your heart. That's not good. Yeah, well, it's like I was like, dude, what, like, what are, what do you, like, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna die? Like, they're like, we don't know. You gotta, we we're, we're sending you home. You gotta go. Like, you're going tonight. You're going, you're going to Germany. Private and, jet. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, nice. So they're like, so they're like, you, you, you gotta go. Um, and, and they're talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. They're like, yeah, we, we might take like a wire that has like clamps and we might stick it down your, you know, <laughs> in your neck painful. and go in your heart, or we might have to do heart surgery. I mean, they're telling me some stuff that's like that's freaking you out at <sighs> twenty four years of age, twenty three. Yeah, it was like we might crack your chest. I was like, no, not my chest. I work out too. <laughs> I, I put too much work into this. Don't I'd mess rather, with the cosmetic surgery. I rather die. <laughs> I <laughs> rather. Me. I'd rather die than not be beautiful. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, you know, like, so, you know, they, around, you know, sometime real late at night, they send me yeah. there. And by the way, when you fly with like as, as a uh, wounded person, it is, it is a meat cart. It is stacked bodies on gurneys like ch -ch 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 up and everyone is just fucked up. You look down, it's, just, it's, it's, it's like a saw movie. We walk through there like, Oh fuck, dude, the people are like missing stuff and, and they're like, alive. Yeah, they're alive and they're on there. So they put you in a, in a, in a thing and I can walk around still. Like I'm the mm -hmm. only person that's like leaving that can walk. Right. And they're like, you want to go down for a little while? And it's like, yeah. And he just fucking grabs this and puts morphine in there. And you're like, you're like, oh, 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 oh. And just, and four hours later, you get up and he's like, you want to go back down? <laughs> sure. <laughs> you're like, oh, I mean, it's, it's like, it, it feels like what the movies show people doing heroin. <laughs> like morphine. It's like, oh, Oh yeah, it's like put you out. Oh, I mean, they are not light with that morphine. They're, they're very heavy hand. Couple doses. I think. Well, I think also, you know, if you're a soldier and you're dealing with wounded soldiers, mm -hmm. the empathy is pretty high. Absolutely. But um, now I got to Germany. I was, mm -hmm. and I and I was told I was the first person to ever walk in the ICU. Walk in the ICU. They said, yeah, I was the first one to ever walk in the ICU. People were visiting me mm -hmm. because they they were hearing it. But they they told me they they were telling me that they were like. Um, yeah, it's like, yeah, we heard about you. You walked in the ICU. It was like, what's going on? It's like, you're the first person to ever do this. Like, so people will start visiting me. The general of the hospital came to visit me. How cool like, is that? Two star came in. Yeah, he, he was a musician. He started, he had a guitar there. So nice. Give me a guitar. He started playing. He's like, really good, too. Like, really a little good. Little Bon Jovi. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a medical uh, officer. So I'm guessing he's a um, kind of hippie. And I think it was more like Beatles. I mean, Beatles. Yeah. It's like, his era. Yeah. This is like a. 12, 13 years ago. So. That was nice of him. Did, yeah. he, did he give you a coin or anything like that? Coin you? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I've gotten tons of them. Bunch of, yeah. That was nice. 
Yeah, and then I went back to you know eventually got back to DC and then you know eventually got back to my unit, but never really, really redeployed. And you got a big medal for that one, didn't you? Well, I got a purple heart. Got purple like heart. CIB. You know, okay. got got the things you need. Got the things I needed to make sergeant. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Almost lost your life, but you got sergeant. Yeah, actually, I uh, we we're we we're joking about before we flew out. I was like, I think I made my points on a purple heart. Thank you. Because like I think it's forty promotion points for a purple heart. Mm -hmm. I think we were, we were actually even talking. My team, we we're all talking about because you know. We're, we're all specialists and the, though I'm in charge, we're all the same rank and mm -hmm. you know, we're all gone to the board now and, and we're like, yeah, we're all waiting to become, you know, sergeants and, and E5s mm -hmm. and, and, you know, maybe go for a career. And we were actually talking about like, yeah, how, how are we going to get this point thing figure out? I was like, mm -hmm. and I, th I think, I think we actually, so one of us said, he's like, yeah, purple heart is 40 points. <laughs> wow. And that was like right before we got out there. How did that make you feel? You got the purple heart and you got promoted do you have any regrets about all that or was it something you look forward to in the next chapter in your military career or you after that all that are you kind of done you're like you know what i'm ready for my next season of my life no i doubled down i went to lurse after that mm -hmm. i went to a long range surround unit really yeah i took over a team there and um wow yeah yeah i went i went um yeah so i actually doubled down i re-enlisted wow right after that so you did four then you did what two more or something <sighs> three more wow you had seven years yeah, just seven years, but I never deployed after that. Mm. We, you know, we were a part of the uh, the surge, and after that, there was a drawdown, mm -hmm, um, right? And I kind of got a little bit caught in the drawdown. So got it. And yeah, about the about about the time I got out, like my body started kind of feeling it. I started kind of breaking down a little of bit. Of course, all those injuries. It's yeah. gonna start feeling it. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. so you got disability from the government for all your pains and mm -hmm. good, good for you. Yeah, you not not a hundred percent, but okay. doing pretty good. Um, wow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So you're a miracle you're here. Yeah, well, that wasn't even my worst injury. Not? No. The, um, so 11 months before I got blown up, mm -hmm. I was actually crushed by a striker. Whoa. So, like, I was, uh, I was, we're out in Yakima Training Center, which is like a, um, the desert training center in Washington. And, um, we, uh, a vehicle broke down and, uh, we had to drag it through the desert with another vehicle and we got stuck in a ditch. And I was taking off the tow bars. And a bunch of us were, and most most of the people at the wall quit, and I just kept you know being a hard headed, just kind of kept doing it. And when I took the tow board finally off, the brakes failed, and one crushed me to the other, and popped both my lungs. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So like I I popped both my lungs, I lacerated my spleen, I broke my L four vertebrae, the wing of it, not the not the mm -hmm. center part. Not that I'm a doctor, but um, yeah. So like that was eleven months before getting blown up in Afghanistan. That was before Afghanistan. Yes, I, I actually did two of those in a year, which is kind of wild. Like I, 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 it wasn't even a year apart. It was like eleven months. It's amazing you're walking. Yeah, it's getting a little harder. But <laughs> <laughs> it's getting a little harder. <laughs> no, and you can laugh about it. I mean, that's just resiliency right there. Oh well, I appreciate that. But yeah, that would that was a uh, that's something I, I do mm -hmm. think quite quite a bit because I mean I, I bled out for a while. You know, and and you know, having my lungs, you know, filled with blood, and just you know, my friends like holding me while I'm like just bleeding all myself. You know, because it's not it's a remote place, so you got to get a you got to get a helicopter out there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's kind of remote, desolate. Yeah, and you're suffocating the entire time. You're slowly suffocating. They don't have a trauma center right around the corner in Yakima, Washington. Yeah, that's where I went. Mm -hmm. That's where they flew me out to. And uh, I mean, my uh, my PA mm -hmm. actually told me he didn't bring all of his gear. Cause he thought he was just going to come out there and pronounce me dead. Wow. And if she's like, he told me like later, mm -hmm. like, yeah, I showed up and you're, you're alive. You're, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know. I thought you were, yeah. you know, and all that saved me was the fact that my, I had my uh, ballistic plates on mm -hmm. and it's side to side. The plates took the compression for a second before they've got the, before the driver was able to pull forward. Wow. Only thing that stopped me from being cut in half. Yeah. So. You have some guardian angels working over time or something protecting your body. I guess so. Something's yeah. going on over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, the man uh, of nine lives. Yeah. Is that your call sign now in the military? Nine lives. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do remember a, a friend of mine saying, "It's like you're the most unlucky, lucky guy I ever met." In my life. <laughs> yeah. But, wow. What a story. Yeah. Wow. We got some uh, listeners plugging in. Thanks, guys, for uh, plugging in to the live stream. We appreciate it. Um, Hope you guys are enjoying Paul's story of war and army and surviving trauma. Yes. Yeah, so some of these people actually work with me. Perry is talking right there. He's actually, he, he worked for the company. Oh, did he? Okay. So it's Juanita and uh, some of them I don't know though. 
Okay, that's cool. Yeah. And my mom is right Hey, here. mom. <laughs> hey, Jermaine. How you doing, buddy? I see you up there. Thanks for plugging in. Thanks for the compliment. So, yeah, and the whole time I was actually uh, fighting, too. Oh, yeah. You were amateur MMA or pro? No, I never turned pro. Okay. Never so turned just... pro. I was, I, was getting, I was getting close. Um, you know, you kind of, in MMA, you kind of decide when you're going to turn pro. Mm. Um, whether someone gives you a fight when you turn pro is a different story. But, you know, a lot of times you want to game it. But, yeah, I, I was fighting amateur all through the, um, my time in the military. Even competed for the Army mm -hmm. um, in their combatives program. I actually went all Army uh, to the tournament in uh, Georgia in 2010. I believe in 2012 when I was thinking about going back, they they actually started canceling it, mm -hmm. the army. But yeah, no, I I I fought you know for the army and I, I was fighting outside as well. And when I got out and I moved back to South Jersey, I started fighting again and, and took it took it more seriously for a while. You're pretty good at it. I remember being in Las Vegas with the Close Protection Conference and the Cowboys uh, were <laughs> oh, yeah. getting into it. We're like, and you're ready to just jump in there and Man. go help out. I'm like, dude, you don't have any insurance. If you get hurt, you're you're screwed and don't. Like, don't do it. I think some of the alcohol has something to do with it too. <laughs> a, little, a little bit of it. <laughs> I'm sure. Mm. But yeah, you have been fighting and you're just a natural. It seems, it seems like it's in your DNA to protect people. It's just natural. That's just who you are. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I appreciate thanks for, thank you for the comment. I don't, sure. I don't know. Um, I, I guess a, a lot of it is, is to, to, to push yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the one good, beautiful thing about mixed martial arts is that you you truly push yourself to your limits, not only just in the ring, usually not in the ring, but right. like in training. Mm -hmm. You know, you get you get to these points where you're truly, you know, you and your partner are truly falling over each other, like yeah, that you can't even, you know, the the truly give a hundred percent of yourself mm -hmm. in, in in training is 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 special, and it's it's actually especially with COVID, something I really miss. I'm I'm looking forward to. Um, eventually get back to it because you know I, I haven't been able to do that because of you know gym's closing and, mm -hmm. and everything like that and also starting a family um you got a newborn i do congrats yeah married yeah I georgetown got, living the life of uh an up-and-comer business owner out there georgetown <laughs> protected services yeah i appreciate it congrats thank you thank you um yeah for the record uh, i've known paul for what a couple of years now yeah years. and uh he has uh taken care of some uh private clients of ours yeah and um went to the white house on a couple of those events and that's all we can really say yeah which i'm very grateful for hey you Appreciate did a great job we got a return call back on that one. Oh, that's outstanding the, you, have a, uh, you have a tight ship over there no i appreciate that i really appreciate that you know it's, it's not me it's my team absolutely that's you know paul that's one thing i love about the military it's kept us humble and we realize the importance of no I an individual, but T is in a team to make success. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with you. And I think, you know, a lot of times when, de when dealing with security firms, I think that that's where a lot of people kind of, they kind of do it wrong that they, they're, they, um, too many people want to make the company their company and they want to run every aspect of it. And, and the fact is you can only go so far, if you can't, you gotta take a you gotta take a leap of faith on your on your people, mm -hmm. on your on your your managers. You you have to, because they can do more than you, and they're they're going to know things that you don't know. You don't know everything. You know, matter of fact, I know very little. And the you know, I find people and bring people in that have diverse backgrounds and things that I have no idea how to do, and really just try to mentor them because I can't you know. This last thing that we did um, with the inauguration, I fielded over 50 people, which is by far the furthest people are, most people are put in there. 50? 50, yeah. That's about a lot 50. of body agents. Yeah, exactly. And if I had to actually do all that, it, it wouldn't, it would have fallen apart. And it, ta it takes an entire team of people to go out and to manage their own pieces. But, but, you know, to do that, you, you have to, you have to have a trust in people that many times people in this industry don't have. That's so true. Yeah. But, so true. But but that's how you but that's how you win. That's the only way. The trust. Yeah. I mean, you look at every other company mm -hmm. as a hierarchy. <laughs> they do. So like why why is your you know your boutique security firm not? Because mm. the thing is, especially when you deal with your you know, your big box um security management firms, you know, your your G4S is your Pinkertons, your you know, so and so. Mm -hmm. Um you know, they will give you as much work as you can handle. They're making the judgment call if you can handle that. They'll give you literally all the work if they think you can field it. 
-hmm. those managers, you know, what they, what they don't want to have, what they don't want to have happen is they don't want to say yes to a job client. And then you can't provide last minute because it fell apart. So mm -hmm. like with any of these companies that you're working for, which, you know, we entirely work for, we don't really go out and find our own clients at all. Mm -hmm. It's not in our business model to, to, to take client, clients organically. We almost always work within companies. And, and that's been your success. It sounds like you've been, you understood your role in the industry. You realize you're yeah. a boutique company and you realize that, Hey, I'd rather be a vendor of exactly. XYZ company and service them and do a good job and get repeat business versus trying to go and get a contract and not having a million dollars in the bankroll to show I can support payroll. And it just, it's, it's like, pros and the cons of being a vendor. No, exactly. And I mean, I, you know, no one ever really talks about it in mm -hmm. this way, but if you really broke down mm -hmm. the security industry into security management firms and security fulfillment firms, mm -hmm. it's so much easier to look at it like that. If you look at there's, there's, there's people who have the ability to have national clients, CNNs, the, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, Facebook, the apples, they, they have, they can have the ability to have those kind of relationships but they had to reach out to fulfillment companies mm -hmm. in regional areas to to fulfill their contracts. Right. They, you know, I don't. Is there is there a company in the world that's licensed in fifty states? Like, I don't know, maybe Allied Barton. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, or I'm sorry, Allied Universal now. Sure. Um, maybe them, but most most of them aren't. It doesn't really make sense. It's mm -hmm. for them to do it. Some places you can't because you might have to actually be incorporated in that place. So yet you have to reach out to these vendors. So if you just decide like, Oh, I'm going to be a, you know, a, a vendoring company only, and I'm going to build relationships with other companies and just get out the idea of taking on a bunch of organic clients, you're going to be better. And, and not only that your, your, your work is going to be more diverse because you, as a boutique company, you might get one or two main clients and you might have a 50, maybe even 60% margin on it. Mm -hmm. But what happens when you lose that client? Yeah, exactly. Good point. You know, when you deal when you when you deal with management companies, mm -hmm. then you have a diverse clients. Th them keeping the client is their job. Mm -hmm. That's their job, and that and that's a job that I am not ready for. Mm -hmm. Managing people that's that's something we can handle. And you know, maybe one day it will it will turn the corner and and do the other thing. But we're not there yet. And I think so many companies um, and so many people they 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 just see the dollar signs. And they just run at you know what's going to make them the most money, but they they don't they don't respect the process and they don't understand the importance of of building leaders and taking yourself out of the equation. Like you know, I'm obviously you know when you talk about Georgetown Protect Services, you you mostly talk about Paul Turner now, but mm -hmm. the the goal is for that soon not to be the case. That I'm not really this figurehead of the company. That the company is is something else besides me when you talk about g4s you don't you know there's not a guy that comes unless you know someone g4s you right. don't have a specific idea pinkerton outside of thinking of you know the the, the brand actual, the name yeah or the actual pinkertons mm -hmm. at one point right and and you know a brand and a company can be greater than you and it can be it, it could be more than you can ever be and, and honestly it should be if, if you think about fulfilling mm -hmm. your life's goals if you fulfill it fulfilling like um you know the greatest of life pursuits it's to build something better than you does that come from the military, the team, the team cohesiveness and building the morality and keeping the morality of or the moral value of the team together to fulfill the mission of whatever the mission um, is? Maybe a little bit. The structure definitely did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I see myself now as a, uh, you know, as a battalion commander and I have, you know, companies. That, when you run your company. Uh, yeah, that I handle. I have, I I have captains that they run their teams. So like. Oh, we got a comment there. Oh, <laughs> you know Anthony? Yeah, Anthony is uh, one of my managers. Oh, thanks for joining us, Anthony. Yeah, nice the comment. We appreciate it. Uh, Anthony's actually taking over our biggest client um, next month. Congrats, brother! Yeah, he's so he's. Uh, we're very excited that he's gonna Perry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hey, know Perry! We, thanks I for joining we, us. I know when we started this, we had messenger on. Oh our yeah, blowing up over there. Thanks, guys. Appreciate the comp the comments on there, but you know, really, after a while, in my opinion, and, and like, it's funny that I talk about these things. I mean, this yeah. could really, really, really blow up my face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could, my company could really shit the bed fast <laughs> because I have some like 
really dumb ideas that don't work. And so it is kind of funny at this point sure. for me to like grandstand about what I'm doing, but I guess that's why the po- we're doing a podcast. So, um, yeah, but I know the big, the biggest, one of the biggest reasons why you're just part, you experienced history on January 6th. You called me and said, dude, you won't believe what's going on. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm on the ground. I'm like, yeah, what? And Hey, Chris, do you have that video? We can show that video and you can narrate it there, Paul, when we see it. Accidentally found myself on the, basically on the steps of the Capitol as they, the riots start. Like uh, we were with, we were with like the, probably the first 20 people in and my client was like, Oh, we got to go. And I was like, uh, you know, without even thinking, just jumped over with them and, you know, to, to, fil- to, to not to, not to protest, obviously, but to, to film it. And he, you know, he just got a little too close. He got a little too involved and, you know, he's yelling things like, yeah, you know, if we get, a, if we get arrested, we get arrested. And, you know, have you been mace yet today? And all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, all right, man, look, listen, as I'm here to tell you what's safe and not safe. And, hey, this is not safe, you know, and I can't be arrested. You can be arrested. You know, you're you're a photographer. You're not licensed. It's like I have a company license. I have a plethora of personal licenses. It's like I cannot get arrested for treason and run a security firm. I can't have the FBI hunting me down and and still like provide for my family mm-hmm. and and to run a company. And I I did something that was actually really hard for me to do was I had I had dropped my client. I took the I, he paid me ironically paid me in cash i know running all these people but people are still paying me in cash sometimes mm-hmm. and handed back you know, just gave it back to them i said you know i gotta go you just felt a little guilt come over you oh my immediately. god oh it's crazy how bad i felt at the moment it's crazy and i'm looking after like you know the, the most no, my company and my family and yet like giving up a client and being like hey you're on your own like i, I we talked we tried you know if we were a, we had a little more separation if i wasn't like mm-hmm. if, if i wasn't six inches away from the police and there's like you know everyone's getting in fist fights i mean like i was really there like at one point i was like face to face with um with the um with police and and, and and their ride gear stuff like that and not that i'm scared that i'm gonna get beat down or something like that but there's a there's a, a point where you're like, oh, I'm suddenly and accidentally doing something that seems very illegal, and maybe even treasonous. So your 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 life is flashing before your eyes that minute, that second when all things are breaking loose and about ready to ex- everything's about ready to explode. Well, no, I, I, I it's actually the opposite. Okay. You know, initially, most of the group, at least the group I was in, I mean, there's left and right, and mm-hmm. you know, and also the backside, which I could never even know what was happening at the time. Mode. Mm-hmm. But like when I showed up there, everyone like rushed. You know, fast. It was, it was actually. I hate to laugh about situations, but we should laugh about every situation. Mm-hmm. Um, there was like five police officers on the on the uh, front lawn, telling everyone to stop, and they got ran down like ran a down. middle school football team <laughs> against the Patriots. No kidding. Oh, they just got trucked. I mean, you're the talking mob. It's like five co- like five officers who are not. You know, you, you see when you watch the videos on, on, on news, you see a lot of that. You see like officers like, oh, it's um, it's mm-hmm. a thousand people and it's three of us. And I think they saw the first five people get like ran over a little bit, and they were like, you know, they were like they were trying to almost it was it was actually almost looked like football. They were trying to like almost block for a second, sure, and just like the amount of people just running through them, just like just piled on them. And but once we got up to the steps, like no one actually knew what to do. Mm. So like everyone's kind of like stopped. And we're just standing there and they're like, you know, kind of like looking at each other and the cops are kind of looking at them. And like, you can even see like some of the people like right next to me are kind of like joking with the cops. And then the cops are like kind of smiling and laughing back. And there's like, for a second, they're like kind of like joking. Like, were they? Yeah. Like, you know, cause that's, mm-hmm. the, and I think that's the thing about the, the Republicans and these, these, these MAGA people in general, is that sure. they're, they're, their kind of whole thing is that they're pro law enforcement, mm-hmm. but at these certain points they have to kind of like go against, you know, they have to, kind of break the law a little bit, you know, to, to, to do whatever they're going to do. So it's like, it's probably kind of very difficult for them to kind of get over that. And the cops, frankly, is probably a little difficult. We got a comment too. Ah, that's uh Josh Davis, another one of my managers. Thanks. Hey Josh. Thank you. Meredith. <laughs> my, my wife's solid patriot. <laughs> that's your wife. <laughs> yeah. Hey wife. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Me. <laughs> yeah, she's very excited to see Tom Brady win the Super Bowl. Oh, was she? Oh, another one, Nikki. 
Oh. Uh, thank you, Nikki. <laughs> That's my sister. <laughs> um, so, I mean, but but it's, it's crazy because they, they kind of stop and they're yeah. like, they're kind of like, oh, yeah, we're like the same thing. We're, we're kind of like, you know, all blue collar people. Some of them they found out were cops or had been cops or military or something like that. The craziest thing I saw, I think it, I think it took a picture. Of it. I'm, I'm going to my phone, look a picture of it. Yeah. It was it was really really telling is that you know the some of the people who work there probably probably the Capitol police or you know sure. people working there they mm -hmm. have their trucks parked out because mm -hmm. you can you before now you yeah. still park at the Capitol and one had all the stickers three percenter you know all the all these you know Mo and Mabe kind of stickers mm -hmm. I was like man that guy's got to take those stickers off before he shows up to work tomorrow because those people because that's like the stickers and the flag he had like all of them don't tread on me like right I was sure. like. I was like, oh, he needs to get rid of that stuff before he shows up to work tomorrow. He's going to get in trouble. So everybody you saw there in that crowd of, what, 3 million people at the rally? Mm -hmm. was a majority. It was just like you said. It was a lot of patriots. You didn't see the BLN people, the Antifa that were disguised in Trump gear or whatever. Did you see any of that? I've heard stories of that. What did you see out there? One in specific. A one? One, uh, one in specific okay. that I tell. There's this guy. Mm. He shows up. To, he's, and, I, and, you know, these things a lot of these people are crazy and i don't mean like oh you're oh wow you're crazy no i mean they're they're, they're homeless people who are crazy and they just interject themselves into interject these, in, into sure. these protests mm -hmm. there's one guy he has like a bunch of facial tattoos and like this kind of scraggly beard that comes down here and he, mm -hmm. you know he's got like really unfitting clothes and and i've seen him both at black lives matter rallies going crazy and, and inciting violence I, I saw him right there next to me in the capitol mm -hmm. i actually can i um I've, I've looked, watched some live streams. Some people live streamed it, and I've actually been able to pick him out. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure he's on the he was on the FBI most wanted list at one point. No kidding. Yeah, I got I actually got a, a picture of that on the phone because we would we'd actually would find I, I would personally would find some of these people that they were listing out there in the crowds. Right. There's so many people like if you're yeah. not, if you're not out there actually looking for them, it's it's, it's kind of hard. To get. But I know you covered a lot of the uh, protests before January 6th throughout DC that was going on. You're all over the place. I would say I probably had been at every significant protest situation since May. That's wild. I've been at all of them. I've lived at Black Lives Matter Plaza. I've slept there. I, 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 I've, um, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was constantly, I, I, my wedding night, I worked. <laughs> I bet your wife was happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> now no, my, that was I, a bad, my bad family, argument. my family sacrificed a lot for me. I'm sure they did. It sounds they, like they did. They, they have, they have, and they still do. I mean, even flying up to California and, Mm -hmm. um, hey, Chris, do you have that video of the car getting, police car getting smashed? What do we want? No! What do we want? Justice! What do we want? No! No, justice! Just do the smoke right here. Smoke is very hard to breathe. No tear gas for you. Yeah, um, it was, man, it's 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 kind of weird to talk about it because in one way I can I can kind of very like minimize. I'm like, oh, you know, it's a, it's a protest and I did my job and mm -hmm. you know, not like I not like I got hurt or something like that. And, and and there's also a way you can think about it very deeply about you know what this meant for a country and what it means for a country and mm -hmm. and they're they're very opposite. You know, the one thing I'll say is that, and this is just my personal feeling, I'm, I'm sure other people, and there's plenty of other people who worked out there and plenty of other companies are out there too. But like when I, sometimes there's, you know, people in the industry who like say really dumb things about security. Like they'll say things like, oh, security operators or we were operating. And it's like, no, you're, you're, you're a security guard. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like, you're not, you're not operating. This ain't SEAL Team 6. This, no. this ain't anything like that. Right. For about a week in May, I cannot describe what I did as anything less than actually operating. Like the, hmm. the, 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 the severity of the situation in downtown Washington, D.C. and the job that we had to do was so extreme that I, I couldn't call it anything else. And I, when, I, when I mean this mm -hmm. is that I can't bring any firearms in, in, into, into there at all. You know what I was armed with? I, I had a fire poker 
from hmm. my fireplace. Yeah. Because I didn't have a baton. I didn't have a folding baton because nothing like this ever happened. And then, you know, I don't know. I didn't know at the time that DC was totally legal to have a, you know, baton. Mm -hmm. And I and I couldn't find a pepper spray. So I like last minute going out, took a fire poker, took the end off and put it in my backpack and had it out here oh, okay. as a baton, True. as like a makeshift baton. Because mm -hmm. it was it was that real. Like it was that extreme. We would go out there and we'd walk sometimes 20 miles a day. And sometimes I'd be running it. I did, if I had to drop a team off one place to go and then sure. pick up another team because we're so short, you know, and, and they had needed me out there in five minutes, and, and it's an extremely violent situation. If I'm running five miles to run, five, you know, do it, like, that's why you train. So I'm running the five, I, I would run down there, like in full, you know, fully run down with all my gear. Um, you know, it would be this constant situation where, you know, you're not in charge, the cops aren't even in charge. They can't get a hold of the situation. They're essentially operating out there because yeah. they're in this denied and you know, desired denied area. And then it's me with my fire poker and a camera crew. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And like, you know, like we mm -hmm. and, and me and my team, like we we really quickly picked up this kind of like almost operator thing. You can start kind of dressing like it and mm -hmm. like just out there, just you know, just wearing whatever's comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, that's why we don't really now, unless it's something specific, we don't even wear like the usual security black and, you know, black polo and, and khaki pants. Cause that, you know, you're targeted. So we'd come out there and be like really just ready to go. And we live out there for, you know, we do 22 hour assignments. That's insane. Moving the entire time. And, and you're dealing with people like the most violent situations. Like, thank God I didn't get killed, but I don't know sometimes how I didn't get beat to death. Yeah. I wonder. I've had like groups of people like pile onto us and about rage to just tear up our camera crew. And, you know, we had to kind of talk them out of that. And that's a crazy thing is that mm -hmm. you had to like, when you do these kind of things, you're like de-escalating and talking as you're about to get like mobbed by some really angry people. And this is something they don't teach in EP schools at all. It's new. It's, we, exactly. This is the new part of the executive protection we have never seen before yeah ever and i and and, and i don't want to take all the all the all the credit for it i mean no. a lot of great people worked out there yeah but yeah i had some hand in like developing like this kind of new thing i mean it, it exists in other countries i'm sure but like out here in dc like i was making it up as i go along like the whole mm. i remember talking to right. uh one of the companies uh one of the you know managers of the companies that uh that, you know that we broker with and um and talking about him about like listen like we're, we're getting rid of all the ideas of like uniform mm -hmm. and anything like that it's like people are coming out now dressed plain clothes and i remember him like going up and starting telling people that and like it started circling around facebook and then we cut took him further we started dressing like antifa mm. i have like antifa clothes i have like joe biden t-shirts like vote vote for joe shirts just and, to blend in yeah covert it, it you we would get to this point because mm -hmm. not only get to blend in sometimes to get the media into like a protest or like a march you have to like do you have to like talk your way into it so you're talking to like some antifa guy and or some black lives matter uh, fella and you're like negotiating terms of the camera crew participating really yeah you're doing all that yeah, all the time. All, wow. A, a multiple times. Matter of fact, I think, believe Anthony was specifically was on one of those yeah. jobs that we did that who was uh, messaging a minute ago. Yeah. We're like, we're out there and I'm like in black skinny jeans and a black hoodie and a, like a full mm -hmm. face mask. And it is, when you do some of these things, it is funneled chaos the whole way. And you're chasing around your camera guy and your, um, and 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 these guys are getting you know beat up something like that. The craziest thing about media security in this environment is that you're going to fail. You're going to it's going to go wrong. It is someone's going to put their hands on your cameraman. Someone is going is going to attack. You're you're you know it's 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 going to go to chaos, and you have to keep going anyway. There's no you're there's no perfect situation, and it's but it's also great because you can use you know. You can use, you know, your, your EP skills and actually fail at a little bit in a real world situation and still be okay. You, the media knows they get it They're You know, no cameraman has ever got, got touched by someone. It was like, uh, how, how dare you? You're supposed to protect me against that. You know, most of the times it's, it's, we're all in, in it together. Well, you had a moment in, in those circumstances. Did you have a time in your mind where you were like afraid for your life? You're uh, fearful and you had to like figure out how you're going to get out of a bad situation all the time or was that? No. Never happened. No, I um, 
I would prepare myself for before I'd go out. I, I mean, it kind of, sounds kind of uh, advanced, advancing in your mind kind of thing. Yeah, it sounds kind of corny and maybe mm -hmm. trite, but like um, I started getting really involved in uh, Stoic philosophy. Um, you know, uh, like Marcus Aurelius, like we we're talking about meditation before we started. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, Book of Five Rings. You know, I, I started. Um, you know, I don't have time to read all these books again, but mm -hmm. I would start going on YouTube and kind of listening to it, and I would start really meditating on this, and mm -hmm. it start like kind of like almost bringing back this this military thing. And then mm -hmm. that's the wildest thing is that you know, with some of the damage that I, I I've occurred in my life, and the, the psychological damage of of you know my military life. You know, I was really kind of coming to terms with a lot of stuff. I went, flew out to Florida to to be a part of a um, like a retreat for two weeks. And you know, the, the the weirdest thing is that they would be like, you know, your home, it's over. But then six months later, I'm going through like a near war situation in Washington. It's like, it's, you know, I, I, wow. I think I was talking to my dad about that. I was like, it's like, you know, they say they say it's done, but like, it's like, look at the news. It's, it's like it's just begun. You know, I had a conversation with my commander about that. And I said, you know, is it crazy to think that I might be one of the first participants in the next civil war? And he's like, no, it's not. And he's like an intel, you know, he's he's like in some. What's his stuff. rank in the military? Uh, he, I get it. He got as a major. He he works major. he works in uh, more interesting fields. Let's put that way now. Interesting. Um, I don't want to you know bring up yeah too much of his stuff, but like sure. you know, he's 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 a guy who's you know probably read in. And he's like, no, it's, it's not. It's not crazy to think that at all. So he's think he's thinking th things are going to be happening. Oh, he, soon. he can't really say. You know, he knows, but he can't yeah, classified yeah. information. But but you know, I, I called him and like you know, asked yeah. him about and asked him about leadership and mm -hmm. and things like that. And I was like, you know, am I crazy to think these kind of things? And he's like, no. It's like no, it, it kind of looks like that. And you you, someone who probably like maybe thinks a little too deeply on things sometimes. It's like you are kind of stuck occasionally in these profound situations in your in your country, and you're you're you're, you're in front of the White House. They, I'm doing this stuff, and I'm looking over, and the White House is there. You know, it's like it, it's 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 really a surreal situation, and you know, you and you just you keep you keep going and you keep building, and, and our company in six months went from, I mean, it was eight months now, but it went from, you know, I I, I hadn't worked in three months, I, I had a that. single it was job, dead, in dead, three months. Mm -hmm. My wife is six months pregnant. A lot of pressure. And I made three and, and two. Feeling last, you know, two weeks ago, feeling over fifty people on an assignment, That's and, and looking at major deals, and it's all because of what happened. It just this whole thing kind of blew up, but it wasn't for a lack of trying. I mean, the, the, and he got sick on top of that. Yeah, I got <laughs> I got COVID on the sixth out there in the capital. You know, when they say that was a super spreader, they're telling the truth. Liberal media got it right. <laughs> like, <laughs> Liberal media got it. That's the funniest thing I've heard so, all day. <laughs> dude, they, they were right. I got. So you agree science is a good predictor? Yeah, okay. abs absolutely. And the thing is, I'm like, doing all right. all, I'm, I'm running this whole company. I'm and you're sick. Phone calls 18 hours a day. I'm talking to you. It sounded like you had water bags in your lungs. Yeah. And I'm like, and, I'm, and the phone won't stop ringing. It's 18 hours a day. It's more. Like, and you're dealing with COVID-19 in your system. Exactly. And I'm, I'm like. Dying, I should be in bed, and I'm like running a company at like red line levels. Like managers, you know, I'm bringing managers on and be like, "Oh, you want to be manager? Good. Well, how about it? Um, we're gonna work you to death and see if you survive. If you do, there's a really bright future on the other <laughs> side of it. There's a carrot. Let me dangle yeah, you. Yeah. You know, which which is kind of how I treat all my managers. I just, right. I, I just like, all right, you, you know, what? it's like I'm gonna believe every word you said about how great you are, and then I'm gonna expect you to perform. And Whew. if you do. Hot seat. What we're going to do, what we're going to accomplish as a company is going to be something you're going to talk about the rest of your life. And that's that's how I, I kind of do it. And that's how I also treat myself. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, I remember scheduling security on the phone with people trying to get manpower moved around and getting maced at the same time. Maced. Maced. While you're on your phone working and trying. I'm holding my client, I'm holding my, a cameraman. I'm on the phone with a company and they're spraying. You know, the cops <laughs> spraying the mace over there. Pepper balls are going out, and like, like, like logistics, man, under pressure. I mean, it's Holy like cow. There, there was things I was doing that was so wild out there in mm -hmm. May and in June. It was just like, you know, I remember, you know, it's like after, I remember it was just constant. And the problem is when weird stuff goes on, mm -hmm. weird people are more emboldened to act crazier. Oh, that's like how? What did you just say? When when weird things are going on, crazy people are more emboldened to act more crazy. So that's so truthful. Yeah, they are profound. That's true. Like I remember, like the 
the probably the day after some of these, like, mm -hmm. you know, after um, Trump cleared the plaza and it was, you know, you know, me and Chuck are <laughs> right there. We actually got caught in like foreign media, like actually doing our job, like right. protecting people. We're like pulling the security out and also trying to make sure they get the best footage. That's, that's the problem. That's, that's the real difficult part about yeah. media security is that you're protecting them. Yeah from the danger, but also letting them get in as deep as possible to get the best shot. You are a part of the film crew essentially because mm -hmm. you're, you're holding them in and you're protecting, you're watching their back and you're protecting them. Sometimes we're, you know, literally with your own body mm -hmm. so they can get the best shot. You are a part of that mission. And that's mm -hmm. why the relationship between, um, security, you know, uh, media security and, and your camera crew. And it, it's so tight. It can be very, very personal. You, you know, mm -hmm. I, like have you know some of the people I work with have I have very friendly relationships now. Of course, hang out with them now because sure they're not like it's not like working with a CEO that's like mm -hmm. there's this distance. It's like no, you're you're part of the crew now. You're part of the team. Um, but anyway, get get back to like some of the things that happened. Like yeah, after the the Trump you know, Trump you know cleared a thing. I remember the next day we just jumped out with a media crew to go check out this house that where this guy like let a bunch of Black Lives Matter people come and hide in the house away from the cops or something like that. Sure. Um. It was like one of the, one of the like many events that happened. Mm -hmm. And like, I remember we jumped out of the van and all of a sudden like some giant dude is sitting there with a hatchet. A he's, hatchet? Yeah. He's on the, he's just right there on the sidewalk with a hatchet. He's like doing this. It's like, you know, like how crazy people kind of like, kind of hit their head a little bit. He's got a freaking ax in his hand. And I'm like, what the heck? It's like my, it's like my, my, my camera person. And then my um, reporter and reporter doesn't even realize it. And I'm like, I was like, you know, you always think about these kind of things. Yeah. Like, when have you dealt with a man with a hatchet? Yeah, that was like a new one. I like just pulled out that <laughs> that fire poker. I was like, thank God I brought this thing, man. And I was just out there and I was just like. Waiting for him. And I just looked at him. I was like, calm down, buddy. Calm, wow. Calm, calm, down, calm down. And he he kind of like was. And eventually he kind of like walked off and like went on to it. But like. He was looking for someone to hack, hack up. I, I don't, I don't, you know, who knows, man, but it's like, Jeez. you're talking about like a sudden issue is like, you know, how he, far away was he from you guys? Oh, you to me. No way. Yeah. I'm sitting here. <laughs> he's got a hatchet and I got a fire poker and we're any, he, he's and, just like, and he's just like, no, he's like beating his this. head. Yeah. With a hatchet in his hand. Like he's hearing voices and yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. Probably. He's a schizophrenic, but he's got a hatchet now. Cause now you can just walk around with <laughs> like, there's a part of DC. There was a time in DC for two weeks. You just walk around whatever you want. Wow. Like, baseball bats, <laughs> like wrapped in freaking, like, you know, uh barbed wire, like whatever you want. <laughs> when we were, um, we were even doing the, 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 tr the MAGA thing. Like people had like baseball mm. bats, like just hanging on a bath pad. Like, you know, there's just too many, these, these, you know, idiots to like, for, for any law enforcement agency to, to get them all up. How many people were over there actually there? I've heard 20,000. I've heard a million. I heard 500,000. What, yeah, what yeah. was your guess? Hey, Josh, what do you think? That's one way to do it. He Josh, was, you there? He was there. Well, maybe he got off. We got maybe a half a million. Half a million? Dude, yeah, I mean, no, it was massive. It was massive, and it was hundreds of thousands of people in the Capitol. Yeah, I mean, it was it was wild, like truly, like I remember, like so. I'm a, I've always leaned conservative, um, personally, mm -hmm. and I remember like watching this go down. And I just picked up a news, a new news crew. It took mm -hmm. about three minutes, yeah, <laughs> to get a new client, and you know, and everyone's calling. People are call so many people are call so many people are calling me that. I can't get a I can't even get a phone call because people are just calling me simultaneously. You it's can't like get it out. it's like I can't get out. And then on top of right. it, like the Secret Service using jammers to you know, kind of that. block. Yeah, like I couldn't. There's points where we just lose service altogether. I heard they're doing that in uh, Wisconsin. They are like mm -hmm. reduce the power to the cell phone tower by such percentage, and it don't reduce the radius of the repeating capability of that tower. Yeah, exactly. They, okay. they they want to minimize you know, electronic warfare. They want to minimize electronic warfare. Exactly. That's what I heard from some Marine friends of mine that are up there working, and I'm not going to tell who said that, but I'll keep that quiet. Oh yeah, yeah. Until it, until we find out, we find a little <laughs> black box that can fix that problem. Exactly. Yeah. Great little repeater, military yeah. style. Oh my God! Whoever comes up with that's going to make some money. Question. Oh, thanks, Perry. About half a million. Good job, Perry. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I agree with him. It was, it was about a, it was about a half a million, and but like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, you know, I've always kind of been a conservative, and, yeah. and I'm kind of a Republican, and I remember like watching 
all those people just go up on the, and everything that happened and then they're like someone just died inside and i was just like some of that republican just kind of melted off to the ground right then and there i was like mm. i don't know interesting well it, times are changing well it's, it's very interesting because you know you you can kind of develop certain mm -hmm. opinions because you're mm -hmm. out there constantly dealing with black lives matter and antifa right and these are two situations which you know, did all yeah which spring are, which are organizations that are that are democratic that are another question liberal and um wow yeah, Tabor, yeah 700,000 easy at the January 6th uh, Trump MAGA rally. The crazy thing about that rally too, that day, I didn't really think about that much. I, I didn't really consider it. I've kind of just been doing this for a while. And I, yeah. was, I was like, yeah, let's just get out there. Let's get the team out there. Let's get people, mm -hmm. you know, we got a detail. And like, I didn't know it's going to like, yeah, going to be like, I was going to be in the middle of like right. American history. <laughs> it unfolded before your eyes. Yeah. I, I, I didn't even, you know, know it is. And not only that, I was with Josh. On, um, Thanks, Chris, for your help. I was with Josh with with a particular client, media yeah. client, and like set it up so that I would just jump off and go take off this like this one mm -hmm. camera guy who wanted to just hire me, and I just kind of like, you know, people people come out to me directly and like, hey, can I hire you to do this? And you know, they have a good reason too. And I'm like, sure, yeah, okay, Let's right. Do it. He's like, yeah, it might be a, might be a little more dangerous. You know, we we're gonna get into it. It's like, well, then I'll I'll take you out. I'm not gonna send one of my guys out to to go do the more dangerous thing. I'll I'll, I'll go do that personally. You know, sure. If I'm, yeah, but it was like I wasn't even supposed to be there. And then I think I even suggested like he's like, "Hey, we're we're we think we're gonna do you know good good shot at we're gonna go see the action." I was like, "Is, is everyone gonna march over to the Capitol? Is, mm -hmm. is that happening today?" And they're like, "Yeah, okay, we we'll just, we'll just walk down there." Like the fact that I just happened to be standing in front of the fence and like the guy left me just like kicks it in. Yeah, is it's it's weird how it all you know life. Thanks, Chris. That. Got another question? Good. Oh, he said it got hot quick. Yeah, it did. It was like, like I was literally sitting there with my hands in my pockets, like, oh, okay, like, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, and I was like, uh, okay. But you, like you said, I mean, you told me over the phone, you said, Mark, it's like the Rust Belt people came out to support this and then went crazy. Yeah. And they got angry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, you okay. know, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was exactly that. The, the middle America came out and mostly, I mean, I'm sure other places too, but a lot of middle America came out and, um, they just felt pissed off, angry because they were lied to about the elections. And you think that was part of it? The uh, misinformation maybe on how the elections went, if it was stolen. You'd, was that, do you hear that talked about at that yeah. right? Man. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I didn't want to. I don't want to take too much more, more video than that because I was like, kind of like trying to protect my client. Yeah. It's so like, in, in I know it's like in media security, like you mm -hmm. can, you can kind of. It's not like doing like EP. It's like you can kind of like take your videos. As a matter of fact, some of my videos have actually made the news. I've actually. Congrats. Oh, thank you. I didn't get paid for it. They didn't pay you. No. TMZ, come on. <laughs> I was talking about. I was, I was talking to one of my guys. I saw. I was watching my wife. I was watching uh, like Nightcrawler or. Mm -hmm. Right. Or yeah, you know what that movie with um. I heard like, about. Yeah, he goes films, um, you know, like freelance films, uh, news. Right. Yeah, so I was like asking, I was like, hey, so I watched uh, Nightcrawl last night, and uh, do you guys pay for this stuff? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're like, no, no, <laughs> no. That they're like, no, we used to, but that's not a thing anymore. And I was like, okay, but right, but yeah, I mean, we've you know we've have actually captured you know footage for our crews and and given it up, and, and it's fine. So we do take uh, some footage and. Um, I think it's valuable. And as long as you do it responsibly, I think it's fine. Yeah. I think the big thing there with the, you know, non-disclosure agreements, uh, non-competes, you got to yeah. honor those agreements with whoever you're working for. And then if you're under your own umbrella, then, you know, you can do whatever you want as long as it's a direct contract. Oh, absolutely. With, for, for, people, and for the people who are going to watch us, yeah. key notice, I never said a name of a company. Roger that. Or a name of a manager or a name, <laughs> <laughs> lesser one of mine. Like, yeah. I, and right. that is, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and uh, non-competes are so imperative, and yeah. you gotta make sure you're licensed, and insured, and all the legal re legalities in the industry to protect yourself. Well, absolutely, and not only that, you're you know, no one wants to hire a guy who's gonna talk. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. It's like that. Um, I noticed one guy he started talking about uh, working with Kanye. Mm -hmm. I've seen him kind of like online a little bit. And it's like, okay. Have you have you seen that guy who's talking? He's, he's I know talking about how bad. Oh, you know him. I know a few of the guys that work with him. Yeah, which is, yeah. is kind of yeah. 
he's kind of rough but <laughs> but gotcha don't even know how bad it is don't talk about it he's uh clean non-disclosure agreements there for a reason but anyway we're gonna wrap this show up and um thanks everybody for watching listening to the fearless mindset podcast and hearing paul's turn story he actually flew out to dc from dc here to irvine to the studio to join us and to share this because what he's shared is very uh um great content for learning how to deal with crowds in these uncertain historical times we're living in the United States. So thanks to everybody for watching and listening. And uh, we'll have uh, uh, the podcast up on YouTube here shortly. And uh, feel free to subscribe. And Paul's company is Georgetown Protective Services. And I'm Ledlow Security here on the West Coast in the Fearless Mindset Podcast. And I want to thank Chris, my producer back there, for making the magic happen and making us look good. Until the next time. Thanks, be safe, and take care of yourself, and happy 2021, and make it a great year. Yeah, we will. Yeah. When life throws you a curveball, how are you going to handle adversity? Welcome to the Fearless Mindset Podcast, where you're about to go on a journey as I interview security business